The Christmas story is a story of love. The story of the Magi coming from afar to see Jesus the King is a symbol of God's love that is for all people, Jews and Gentiles alike. Christmas time is here. Ready or not, it's here. I know this Christmas might not be exactly the way that you had hoped. It might not be as it has been in years past. You might not get to do all the traditions or see everyone. But does that mean that Christmas isn't still magical? Oh, absolutely not. See, Christmas is wonderful, not because of the parties, not because of the gatherings, not because of the presents that we're going to get or not get. In fact, Christmas isn't special because of the condition of society or our health or our finances or our titles or our lack thereof, any of those. Christmas is incredible because 2,000 years ago, a light shone into the darkness when God became man in the form of a baby born to a teenage girl named Mary in Bethlehem on a hillside. Angels sang of this incredible encounter to shepherds, some of the least of that society, and announced the birth of the king of kings in a stable. Oh, friends, Christmas is magical because God came to offer you life, eternal life, offer all who would believe and turn to him hope. In Advent, this season that builds up to Christmas, We've already talked about hope entering the world through Jesus. We've discussed joy last week, uh, and today we're going to talk about God's love, that God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, and a part of that is actually the story of the wise men. Now, it's powerful, and I don't want you to miss this. As I share the Christmas story, they play an important role that is kind of in an extreme opposite of what the shepherds do that we discussed last week. So let me read to you from Matthew. It says, Jesus was born in Bethlehem in Judea. During the reign of King Herod, about that time, some wise men from eastern lands arrived in Jerusalem asking, where is the newborn king of the Jews? We saw his star as it rose, and we have come to worship him. King Herod was deeply disturbed when he heard this, as was everyone in Jerusalem, he called a meeting of the leading priests and teachers of religious law and asked, where is the Messiah supposed to be born? In Bethlehem in Judea, they said, for this is what the prophet wrote. And you, O Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are not least among the ruling cities of Judah, for a ruler will come from you who will be the shepherd for my people Israel. Then Herod called for a private meeting with the wise men. And he learned from them the time when the star first appeared. Then he told them, go to Bethlehem and search carefully for the child. And when you find him, come back and tell me so that I may go and worship too. After this interview, the wise men went their way. And the star they had seen in the east guided them to Bethlehem. It went ahead of them and stopped over the place where the child was. When they saw the star... They were filled with joy. They entered the house and saw the child with his mother, Mary, and they bowed down and worshiped him. Then they opened their treasure chest and gave him gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. When it was time to leave, they returned to their own country by another route, for God had warned them in a dream not to return to Herod. Oh, if not careful, we just kind of zip through Christmas and much like the majority of the world at the time Jesus was born was clueless, much of society is clueless, and we really kind of buzz right by as God is still speaking, God is still sharing, God is still loving, God is still offering light in a dark time. 
if we'll but slow down, put our hearts in a place where we're ready to listen and to see. And I hope that this Christmas, in spite of what it is not, you'll remember what it is. In fact, I think that this could be a blessing in disguise because when we're filling our time, when we have all the stuff, when things are going our way, when life seems to be good and we're just joyous, I've found that it's hard to remember my need of a savior. I've found that often I totally forget that he is Lord in that moment and I'm just enjoying the time. So this Christmas, rather than being frustrated or upset, I just ask that you would stop and consider some new truths with me that I wanna share from the story of the wise men. Now, we don't know a tremendous amount about them. They go by different names. And um, from Magi to wise men to the we three kings of Orient Art, as we sing in the old carol. Now, some of you go, I mean, well, there were three. Uh, and you, Actually, we don't know. We just guessed that, and someone wrote a song about it at one point because there were three gifts. We don't know how many were in the caravan. We don't know how many came. We know there were multiple and that they came. And now we know that they were men of affluence because this was like a 1,500-mile trip, likely from the country of Persia or that area where they traveled to Bethlehem. Tremendous amount of effort and time and energy to get there at a time when you didn't have airplanes, you didn't have fast trains, you didn't have cars, you didn't have a motorcycle. It was by camel or foot, and they had a long time with many perils and dangers along the way. Now, they showed up, and you might have missed this because your manger scene and your nativity set in your house is probably wrong. And, and see, what happens is, is we just, by artist depictions, put the wise men and the shepherds both coming to the stable, but that's actually not accurate to what we just read. Did you hear? It talks about the child, and it talked about, not the baby at this point, but it also talks about a house, not the stable. So this is sometime after Jesus was born, within the first year or two of his life, and we're not exactly sure how much time has passed, but it's now at a home that they came to. Now, you're like, okay, enough detail. What is this all about? What's so special about the wise men being in this story? Well, let me give you the bottom line for today. Christmas is the story of God's mercy and love for all people. It's for, now say this with me, all people. Come on now, you can do better than that. One, two, three, all people. Oh, it's so important to know because if not careful, we say, I know he loves the whole world. When it's not just the world, he loves you. And he loves you and he loves me and he loves you and each one of us individually. See, that is where the wise men help set an incredible picture here from the least to the greatest by human standards God so loved the world. You know, we talked about last week, God's love extends to the seemingly insignificant. Pastor Chris brought a great message about the shepherds and the joy that came there. And here's the thing, by earthly standards, not God's standards, by earthly standards, the shepherds were nobodies. And God announced the coming of the King of Kings, the Prince of Peace, the Lord of Lords, the great I am here has become man on earth to the nobodies. Shepherds were nobodies. Nobody wanted to be a shepherd. When they walked through town, when they came into a market, people would give them a wide berth because they usually stunk. People were like, oh, it's like, yuck. I mean, and nobody dreamed of being a shepherd one day. Here's the amazing thing. God chose the least of these to say, hey, go tell. Go, and, go, go see and then go spread the word that a king has been born. The Savior has come. Not to the affluent, but to the least. Over and over and over again, you see God affirming his love for the least of these. Well, we tend to love those 
who could give us something, those of affluence, those of a power. Now, that doesn't mean that God loves them less. He just starts here with the least of these. Now, let me move on here to now God's love extends to those who seemingly from an earthly perspective are significant. We're talking about the wise men. So from the poorest and the lowest of the low to now the affluent and those who could walk into a town and the king, Herod, would say, could I have a meeting with you that have the affluence to travel something that's going to take months and months to do and to pay for that and to have the safety and probably the guards to help them get there. These guys are of the haves, not the have-nots. To be able to give gold, frankincense, and myrrh, these are affluent, very expensive gifts. And I think it was very clear that God chose the king of kings to be born in a stable, not a palace, to announce to the shepherds, and then to not just the Jews, but Gentile wise men or kings or people of affluence from another country to come together. And now God says, okay, do you get it? When I say I love the world, I really mean it. Oh, I wish, I so wish that we as humans, as followers of Christ, could get that simple truth. That there aren't those who are lovable and those who are untouchable, but they're just people in need of Jesus Christ. We so look at the exterior of a man, of a woman. We look at their power, their prestige, their looks, their physical beauty, or what they drive, the house they live in. And then if not careful, we look at that for ourselves and say, I have value or I don't have value. Please don't believe that lie. It's an ugly lie from Satan himself. You have value because God so loved the world And he so loved you that he sent his son to die on a cross that you might have life, to take your place. So how do we experience this incredible grace and love of God? You know, experiencing God's love depends upon the posture of your heart. I I can't emphasize that enough. To experience God's love, it will depend upon the posture of, of your heart, of my heart. Let me just unpack this for a moment. See, the the shepherds, the wise men, they were humble enough to be looking for, to be listening, to not be threatened by, but to desire and acknowledge the coming of God and his message. You know, the scripture talks about this in more than one place. It, It describes a picture of humility. In Matthew, it says, so anyone who becomes as humble as This little child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. Totally upside down spiritual economy from the earthly economy. He says, you got to be like a child and just trust me. you got to be like a child and come to me. And he says, that is the greatest. That is who the kingdom of heaven is made up of. And that was a good picture of the wise men or the shepherds. Now you go to the other extreme and you have this pride and arrogance found in King Herod. And it was very clear who sat on the throne of Herod's life. Not only did he have a literal throne, he had the figurative throne that he was absolutely in control of his world. But here's the crazy thing. He is a lot like many believers who attend church. See, he believed in the Savior. He believed in the Messiah. He actually researched and knew about it. He acknowledged. But he didn't give control. And my fear is, is that there are many who attend church today who believe and acknowledge and understand and they learn but they're like Herod at heart, they are really sitting on the throne of their life, not God. See, believing in the existence of Jesus Christ and he came to this world is not what brings you salvation. There's a picture and it involves a word that that most of us and as Americans really dislike. Submission. 
and bowing before and submitting is not something that I like. In fact, then as we look at this natural response to God's love and mercy, what is this going to look like? What is a natural response to this, this fourth point? God moved towards us. He, he came to us. He offered us life. And will we respond in love and grace and forgiveness and humility? Or are we going to stay on the throne? See, in... Do you realize you can't love God before he loves you? You know, what, what are you saying? What do you mean? No, no, he loved you before you were born. He looked and thought of you and knew all that you would do, and he said, she's mine, he's mine. Just turn to me. I'm gonna provide a way that you can be with me. He's like, I'm holy and perfect and just, and he knows that we're not. It's like... You know, I have this dog named Harley. I love my old dog. He's 11 years old, Rhodesian Ridgeback, 100-pound dog, big boy. He's now our lumpy, smelly boy, and he's getting towards the end. He can stink a room up. Oh, my word. I don't know what's died inside him, but, oh, it's just terrible. But we love him, and we put up with him. Now, he would actually be symbolically a picture of you to God and to me to God. We can individually stink up a room really easy. We all have stink. <laughs> it's called sin. And how do I respond to the incredible love and mercy of God who says, I loved you so much, I sent my son. He knows all that we'll do, and I, this is amazing. Well, it comes down to this. Let me read this incredible, you could summarize the Christmas story in one verse, John 3, 16. For this is how God loved the world. He gave his one and only son so that everyone who believes in him will not perish but have eternal life. Oh, God loved you so much when he knew your stink, when he knew all your mess, and he says, I'll give my son for you. Oh, our pride so gets in the way here. See, here's the problem. When it comes to positioning our heart in the right place, there is a word that I said before we don't like, and it's this, following demands surrender. See, you... Some of you are, are wanting to say, I'm a believer. I'm a Christian. I believe that Jesus came. He died on the cross. Yada, da, da, da. So did Herod. He had believed in a lot of this stuff. But he still tried to kill him, and he was very clearly on the throne. And so let me ask, do you have that position, that posture of heart where you're humble enough to say, okay, God, I need you. I'm giving you the throne of my life. I'm willing to surrender. You know, surrender is not a word that we like. Submission is not a word that we like. Uh, let me just use an analogy of a marriage for a second. I I've seen so many people who go, man, I wish I had a marriage like them. They got a great spouse. I got a dud kind of mindset. And there's this attitude that, that we think, oh, if only I had a different spouse, I would have it all. And no, because you'd still be there. Yeah, it's, you know, we take us with us wherever we go. And remember, we all have that nice ability to just stink up a room. We can stink up a relationship just as easily. And I know that I brought a plenty of stink into my marriage. You know, the Bible says in Ephesians chapter 5, submit one to another out of reverence for Christ. And then it lays out a picture of submission of a wife and submission of a man and laying down of our rights. And it's not stuff we like to hear. But if you want a good marriage, you have to learn submission. Now, if you want to be a follower of God, that's what a Christian is, a Christ follower, to be someone who is, it's not just a believer in his existence, it's going to require submission where you lay down your way for his way, where you start to lay down your rights and say, okay, God, I just want you to have your way in my life. And I, it's not, I don't have this right to myself anymore. It's God, you've given me everything and I, here you go. It begins by believing that he exists, and then it goes on to where you put your faith, your hope in him, and then you ask for grace, and you make him Lord of your life, not just a savior to get out of hell free. 
And I want you to experience that life. And I don't want to, I'm not trying to make a, a bar so high you can't jump over it. I'm trying to raise the bar to reality so that you don't think that you've already stepped over it when you haven't gotten there yet. See, this Christmas could be amazing. In spite of all that has happened, whether it be government, whether it be finances, whether it be in social unrest or injustice, to all that has happened, to the, the middle of the, the, the whole scare, do I get a vaccine, do I not? Am I gonna get COVID, do I not? Oh. If you found Jesus, oh, it would be a good Christmas. See, there is one thing that I hope that you don't miss and that you would bring what you have, your life, and say, here is my gift to you, God. You gave all. In fact, the air that I breathe, my life that I have, here you go. It's, it's yours. That would be a Christmas of all Christmases. Uh, the wise men gave three gifts and if this represents my life up to this point or your life, they also give a great representation of what maturing love is, you know, what it means to mature as a follower of Christ. And, and I want to unpack that for just a moment. And I hope that you'll just kind of follow along with this theme for a bit, because if not careful, we, we just miss what it means to follow God, to love him, to sacrifice. See, following demands surrender, and followers are willing to sacrifice some things. It begins with time. So I thought this week, what would it represent? And and I remember this is my first nice watch that I bought. I used to have all the little Walmart junk watches, and sometimes they'd have the little dials on them that they didn't work. They were just, you know, the fake dials that a lot of kids have. And I remember when I finally afforded enough, I could afford a nice watch And I got one that had all the little dials that I still don't know how to work. And I have to look up every year how to set the time on. I was like, I got a nice watch. And it was so fun. You know, time is really valuable. It's one of the most valuable commodities we have. And if not careful, we hold on to it. And it's my time. I don't want to share my time. It's my precious. And uh, uh, we kind of get a little greedy with it. And, you know, only 20 to 30% of Americans have served in the past year on a normal year. In church, about 40% of a church attendees serve on an annual basis in any given church. The wise men set a great example of here's my life, and they followed the star, and they went on months-long journey, incredible sacrifice of time to say, here. You know, there are a lot of people who do some incredible stuff in this church family to help it happen. In fact, I'd like to just stop for a moment and just say thank you to our servants. See, we have volunteer lead. You might think, oh, the church staff has done a great job through this vi-. We could not run church on just staff. It's not possible. We work with others who volunteer to serve and to make things happen. I mean, Kenna and Ben cannot do all the children's ministry. They help equip and get things ready for all the volunteers who make children's ministry happen for those who bring their kids and are here and apart and send stuff home to help out those who are still at home. And, you know, Storm and and Harold cannot do all the worship and the music by themselves. They have numerous volunteers and first impressions. Taylor's a very nice person who loves to greet people, but she can't be in all the places at once. We have numerous people she works with, our security team, to our elders. Oh, I'm so thankful for the volunteers who are the backbone of this church. Would you, if you've been blessed by their service, would you just help me to say thank you to all of our servants? Thank you so much. Now let me give you a challenge because some have, as a young man said to me just the other day, he's newer to the church, he's been coming for a while, he says, you know what, I haven't been serving and and I'd, I'd like to serve, but I just don't know how. How do I get off the bench and into the game, so to speak? In the midst of COVID, he's like, do you really have any needs? I'm like, uh huh. Hey, every Sunday, we have no idea where we're going to have enough greeters. We have people running lights and cameras that have never done it before. Sometimes it's like, hey, would you please do that? I'm not really, if you'll just hold it still somewhat, even if it's just in a gentle circle, that's better than nothing. You know, I mean, just somebody. And uh, it's been hard. 
It's been really hard, and I'm so thankful for so many who've just fall, jumped out of bed on a Sunday morning because we couldn't put it together unless one more person came and helped out. You know what? Ellie is incredible. She's our connections minister. She loves to help people get contact. If you don't remember her name, that's okay. Email connections at university.church. You can just say, hey, lady, and she'll respond. She'll love to talk with you. She'd love to help get you connected in one of those ministries. Please. Realize that when you give of your time, you're investing in the kingdom. It's not just, okay, let's go have a service. It's, it's investing that another person hears the message of Jesus Christ. Another individual has hope that would not have had otherwise. Now, let me move on to these followers are going to sacrifice. They gave us a great example of sacrifice. They brought gold, frankincense, and myrrh. They brought their treasure I don't have any gold, frankincense, or myrrh, but I do have what is valuable to me. We love this green paper. It's like I, I, my kids get excited when there's green in their envelopes at Christmas. I mean, I, I, we love just, I mean, this is just money in my savings that I put aside. Marcy and I's finances obviously are all together, but I have a little savings part for my toy money. This is some of my toy money I've been saving up. It's going to give me some new stuff in my truck this year at Christmas. I'm excited for my gift to me. And uh, I, I, um, so don't take it. And uh, um, uh, You know, there's incredible spiritual significance and symbolism, I believe, in those three gifts that were given, gold, frankincense, and myrrh. It's not just a matter of our treasure. These were three appropriate treasures for the Prince of Peace, the King of Kings, the great I am coming. You know, what do you mean? Well, gold was the, the medal of kings. It was acknowledgement of incredible stuff here. It's his kingship on earth. He's being recognized. I mean, the average person didn't have gold. And now this young teenage couple and their little baby, they're given gold to acknowledge the king of kings. Frankincense. This is used in, uh, it was an incense in temple worship of all different kinds of religions, especially of God as well here and the Israelites and the Jews and just a baby. And these wise men gave incense as a sign of that he was worthy of worship. They bowed down and worshiped him. Maybe this Christmas you should worship him. I know we sang songs just a moment ago, and you can sing songs and not worship. You can go through the whole week and talk about God and not worship. See, it has to do with the posture of your heart. And then there's this really strange gift, myrrh. It'd be like showing up at a, at a, you know, this celebration of new life. The young couple just has a baby and you bring them a coffin. I mean, it's an embalming oil. I mean, what in the world were they thinking? It's not appropriate to give a new mom and her baby. But it was perfect in this situation because this baby was the savior of the world who came and he lived in a perfect life. He's the son of God who came to teach us a new way of life. And, and he, he set up a, a whole new picture for us to follow. And, and he met with his disciples right before he went to the cross to sacrifice his life that anyone who believed in him wouldn't perish but have everlasting life. And he gave us a tradition to remember that he came to die for us. It's called communion, and I'd like to ask for each one of you here to grab the elements. And, and for those who are at home, please grab those elements, something out of the kitchen, join with us. You know, if not careful, we miss what it's all about. You know, uh, the, the disciples were clueless when he did this. This is just right before going to the cross. The disciples are like, yeah, we're going to take down Rome. We're going to be on the right and left-hand side of Jesus, and they're arguing over who's going to be the greatest, and there's all this stuff going on. And Jesus actually came to establish an eternal kingdom, not an earthly one. And he came to give his life, not to be the ruler of this world. See, he said, there's only one way to the Father, it's through him. There's only one way to find life and grace, it's through him. And Jesus passed around bread to some clueless guys that he loved deeply. 
And he said, this bread represents my body that's going to be broken. Take it and eat. He took a cup of juice or wine. And he said, my blood is going to be spilled for you and I love you. Don't miss this. Drink and remember. I'm sure they were clueless as he said, as often as you do this, remember the gift of what I've given you here. Proclaim my death until I come again and one day we're going to take part in heaven before the King of kings and the Lord of lords, our Savior, and celebrate it with him again. And until then, we must remember what Christmas, what the gospel is really all about. When it comes down to it, I don't think we're that different from Herod in most cases. See, there's one more thing the wise men sacrificed. It was their security. They had a mad king that was jealous. He killed his wife and three boys because they might overthrow him, he thought, in his head. And he wanted to find out about this, this baby that they came to see. And he's like, come back so I can go and worship him. <laughs> what he really wants to do. And they went against the king's order, and they went home another way. They'd already put their lives on the line, traveling 1,500 miles in a time when nobody could do that. Incredible trip. So I thought this week, what would represent that in my life? What would represent my security? Just simply thought, oh, this morning I finally realized I was walking around my house. It's my keys. See, the key to my house has all my possessions, all that I own, that I hold dear. Inside my house, my wife and my kids, those who I hold most precious live. I lock that door with this key every time I leave because I don't want someone just walking in. And It's the key to my, my vehicle that gets me from point A to point B. It's, it's the key to my office. It's the key to the church. Can I ask you, who holds the keys to your life? In fact, who sits on the throne of your life? Are you like Herod who is very clearly on his own throne of his life in his own little kingdom? Or have you said, okay, God, I want you to reign. I know a lot of you have said, oh God, I want you to reign, you're Lord of my life. But I, I think that it might be more like, oh God, I want you to reign. Here's the throne of my life. There's room for me too. And then, oh, I'm kind of, oh, oh, sorry, Jesus, excuse me. Oh, maybe this Christmas, in the midst of everything, you found yourself sitting back on the throne and you're worrying about things that are not yours to control. And it's time to get off the throne and just say, okay, God, I, I did it again. Please take the throne of my heart, my life, my family, my health, my treasure, my time, it's yours. Oh, dear God, I ask in the name of Jesus that you would do a work in our hearts right now for every man and woman who is listening, every child, every teenager, every student, every soldier. Oh, God, would you speak into their life that they could release and let go, and as they do, they would find life eternal. May they turn to you for their hope. May in the midst of the fear of this world, in the midst of all the junk that's going on, oh, God, may they... Hold on to you, the one who will never let go of them. Father God, I am so sorry for how often I take back the throne of my life. 
And God, I repent of that, and I ask that you'd forgive me, and I pray that others would join in that prayer right now, that they just ask for forgiveness, and that they'd trust you anew, and that this Christmas would be a wonderful Christmas because of your presence. It's in the name above all names, the name of Jesus, we come before you. Amen and amen.